acknowledge Jesus as Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Now, of course, last weekend we kicked off our new series called Modern Mythbusters. And we are confronting the major themes that are confronting the church today. Last week we talked about the great myth that uh, we don't need to trust God. We only need to believe in the assumptions of science. After all, it's natural. It's science. Science is God. We learned last week that Satan is the father of all lives. Meaning he is the master of his craft. He is the best of, at, at the art of deception. Today, I want to approach the second myth. And I want to destroy the second myth this morning. Here is the myth. The myth is simply this. I, was, I want to destroy the myth of homosexuality, the myth saying, I was born gay, therefore my sexual orientation can never change. The myth. Stay with me. Jesus said, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. That word error means you have been deceived. Today, I present to you living evidence. Living evidence of the power of the scripture, the truth of God's word, and the power of the anointed presence of God. That God says, whoever shall call upon me shall be saved. Delivered, transformed, reformed. I want to introduce to you today an anointed woman of God. She is a YouTube hit with over 260,000 views on her uh, poem, My Life as a, My Life as a Stud. Uh, she's going to bring the house down and she's going to. Bring the house of lies down. I want you to bump your neighbor three times and say, neighbor. Mm, mm, mm. It's about to get good in here. Would you stand on your feet this morning and welcome and honor our guest speaker, Miss Jackie Hill. With a single I remember the first time I kissed her lips. As my heart began to flip all 
More convictions beginning to rip. I grab the hips against the bottom lips because I always want to try it. For many years, the enemy infiltrated my thoughts with homosexual merchandise, and that day I decided to buy it, but he tricked me. He had me thinking I could just try one time and see what it was like, and I could move on, but it didn't work like that. One year after me, him, hers, relationship, my gender did a flip like that. Sports, brawls over breast, wife, bitter over chest, white, T over rest. Now the organs that qualify me as a woman lay flat as my back was turned to the king. I was wearing boxes as if I had something dangling in between. But no, I'm still a queen. It seems that I was mysterious, often shaped by the inward rictus skill of my self-esteem and minds was low. I didn't know where to go with these perverted thoughts of mine. I remember they started with some genitals were stuffed into my mouth at the age of five. I'm growing up wondering why I'm crushing on girls. No, no, it's natural to like guys. My heart steadily being hardened because no God with an eye for I just dies. Daddy kept saying hi, then bye, then hi. Now I can't, now I can't, now I can't trust guys. And my D-A-D-D-Y just up and died on me. His funeral was the last time I stepped foot into a church. I refused to deal with the eyes looking down on this deep voice masculine girl. Young couldn't see past my face to pray. Past the past, falling past my waist. Past the fitted caps and the braids. Past the past hurts in my heart. That pattern is extra. Standing before you today, all I wanted was a hug. All I needed was someone to tell me of God's love and the delivering power of his blood shed for the lost. I had to realize how 1 Peter 2.24 lets me know how he became me on that cross. Uh, stud, so I'll be able to die to this sin and live for righteousness. Yet then again, this flesh I man was enjoying itself. Even though the laws of truth were written on my heart, I still chose to choose. I still chose to choose to deny him. And if I didn't repent of my sin and trust in him and this heart inside my chest stopped beating, 20 billion years would have went by and I still would have been frying. Remember the first time I bought my first cyber skin strap on? Paid $135 and it was made to feel real. Even though I couldn't feel that thrill, it was a mental thing. I became a touch me not because I moved the big clothes I was hiding behind came off and she touched that spot. My masculine voice would drop and the femininity naturally placed inside of me would be easier to spot so I had to keep it covered. There was no need for a latex rubber because underneath these jeans ain't no sperm or testicles, just eggs and ovaries. I remember when I was done using that strap on, then I strapped on and it was time for you to use the restroom. I still had to sit down to pee. What a reality check. I never knew it would get this deep, but when I opened up the door, I completely fell in the scales cover. My eyes just got thicker. The darkness made no room for the light. I actually started to consider hell in exchange for her being my wifey. The one day the Lord spoke to me, he said she would be the death of you. In that moment... The scripture for the wages of sin equal death finally clicked. As much as I thought that I loved her, my eternity wasn't worth that chick. My eternity wasn't worth that hit. My eternity is only worth having faith in what Christ did alone. As my wooden nose was single long because of me lying to myself. Instead of me dying to myself, I was willing to die for myself. There was no blue fairy whispering in my ear. Only the devil and me telling me what I wanted to hear. There was no Geppetto pulling on my strings. I attached myself to them things. Being pulled and manipulated by my flesh and them spiritual beings. The more I lied to myself, the more my wood of sin will grow. The more my wood of sin will grow, I can see it in my face. I can see the wood in my face. I can see him stretched out on the wood in my face. Being the disgrace for the sin I was committing in his face. Even though I saw his blood on the wood in my face, taking the Wrath of the Father on the wood in my place. I still spat in his face, but his grace is sufficient. As much as I wished I could be a real boy, my name is not Pinocchio. I'm just me, and he's just he, the real G-O-D, and he's willing to set free all those that are really in need. I know that some may say that they were born that way, but no, my friend. You were not born gay. You were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. When Eve ate that fruit, we were cursed to do anything. We were open for murder. We were destined to lose. You were given free will. You chose to choose. You chose to choose to defy God's rules because inside of you, you want to be like God and make them. I pray you about now because when God comes back, your knees will break in reverence like the Philistine God Dakin. All I'm saying is there is scripture after scripture to show you what your heart already knows is wicked. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, Leviticus 18, 22, Romans 1, 26 through 27. And please, don't be like Lucifer by taking these scriptures out of context and you can continue to cheat God out of his glory and reverence. I know you may be thinking, man, this is me. It's who I am. But the thing is, it's really not. All the girls' clothes and etc. is just a lackluster substitute for who you really need. God. See, every feminine quality, every beautiful curve, every little thing that makes you a woman that you despise was given to you for the glory of God. Only if you can see with his eyes, you will see how beautiful you really are. You are beautiful. You are beautiful. You are beautiful. 
I know your pain may run deeper than you or I know, but you are not Pinocchio. You cannot be a real boy, beautiful. Be you, beautiful. The you God created you to be, beautiful. Be you, beautiful. Because Jesus Christ is worth it. Amen. Y'all so quiet, it was making me nervous. Like, are they listening? That's why you do poetry, that's why you do ministry for the glory of God, not the claps. Um, I'm Jackie Hill, I'm 23 years old, from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I'm just going to get into my testimony and just flow off of that, cool? Um, it's a cool bag, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> so... I was born June 21st, 1989, um, born into sin, so I was kind of like doomed from the start a little bit, and <laughs> around four or five or six, I was molested by uh, my brother's wife's little cousin, and I'm five, he's 13, so to me, he's grown, you know, but that didn't make any excuse for him to do the things he did to me because he was in middle school, right? And so it didn't really like traumatize me or torment me. And like, I just was like, okay, that's what we did. But I saw how it opened me up to perversion at a really young age where I was just doing highly sexual things with dolls, with all types of stuff. Because I mean, that's, I don't know. I just was inclined to do that type of stuff. And I got into porn at like six, seven, eight, got into masturbation at the same age. Like I was just out there real early. Um, so during this time, I'm, I, I remember having an attraction to girls very young, maybe kindergarten, first, second grade. I remember doing things with little girls on the playground and always I had gender confusion very early. I remember um, wanting to just act like a man. Just I thought, you know, I'm supposed to be a boy. And so I would, you know, try to pee standing up and all types of stuff. And this is a six year old doing this with no outside influence it's just me wanting to be different than what i was and it really it really shows the confusion the attack that satan has on us when we're babes um when you grow up with this confusion you know and then and the culture that we we're in they uh they feed off of that big time um but anyway so i'm growing up with all this type of stuff in my mind and i'm having dreams gay dreams like all the time every week it seemed like and so 17 i'm 17 comes and i'm knowing it's a sin because i've seen it in scripture like you know growing up even though i was doing me i i, I would every book i almost read was about god i knew the truth of, of scripture i just didn't believe it and um 17 came and i'm like you know what I, i'm just gonna try this thing like it, it, you know it won't hurt and so this girl, I'm at the senior homecoming at another school, and this girl that I knew from middle school was a lesbian. And she came up to me and she was like, Jackie, you should be my girlfriend. I was like, get away from me with that gayness. Like, I was just like, ugh, get away. But in my mind, I liked it. In my mind, I was turned on by it. And I, I really believe that Satan knew that I wouldn't go after homosexuality on my own, so he presented it to me. We're gonna see what we pray.
inclinations towards homosexuality at a young age, that was the moment I chose it. I made a deliberate choice, I'm going to be gay. Yeah, I never really got attention from men. My father wasn't really in my life. I was very insecure. I believed as a girl that I wasn't pretty. And so when I started dressing like that and people started coming to me and esteeming me, it's like, wow, this is what I have to do to be beautiful. This is what I have to do to be loved. This is what I have to do to have affection. And for me, homosexuality wasn't just sexual. Uh, it wasn't just sexual at all. A lot of it was just itching this insecureness I had in me because I wasn't connected to the source. I wasn't connected to God. So I didn't know that I didn't understand that he loved me above all. You know, like I didn't get that. Does it does it make sense? And so I'm going to these people to get what I can only get from him. October 08, I'm watching like making a band on MTV or something in my bed chilling. And I hear God say, she's going to be the death of you. I hear this. And at the same time that he said that, I didn't equate it with just God convicting me with homosexuality. I saw God is convicting me of sin, period. Because I really saw for the first time that my whole life deserved hell. My whole life was wicked before him. My whole life was just not okay. And I, I asked God, I said, God, but I don't like men. You know, God calls us to come to him, but we automatically equate that with, God, you want me to be in a relationship with a man. When that's just backwards. It's like, God's like, nah, I'm calling you to know me first, right? So I'm like, God, I don't, I don't like men. It's nothing about a man that attracts me. And he just being all good and stuff. He was like, when you learn to love me right, I will restore every attraction or desire you'll ever need for a man. I was like, wow. <laughs> okay. You know what I'm saying? I'm just kind of like brushing it off. And then he starts talking about how he wants to use me and all of this stuff. So I started to weigh the cost of my life versus eternity. And I saw weed, eternity in hell. Masturbation, eternity in hell. Porn addiction, eternity in hell. Disobedience to parents because we kind of downplay that. When God, like, being disobedient being to your parents is a sin. You know what I'm saying? And I was highly disobedient. I was just rebellious. But I'm seeing that hell. And I'm like, man, like, it's not worth it. I really saw that living it up, YOLO, all that. I really saw that I, how is 20 years of rebellion against God tight when I'm going to spend an eternity in hell for it? I really got it. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like, I was like, I refuse to allow God to introduce himself to me, present himself to me and me to say, no, I'm good. And me to die that night and see that I had the chance to know Jesus. And I was like, I'm good. And so in my mind, I'm like, Lord, you know what? You're calling me to do something I know I can't do by myself. I know I cannot walk away from women by myself. I know I cannot stop smoking by myself. I know I cannot do all these things on my own, but I'm believing that you can help me. And I, I, like I tell everybody, I didn't know that was repentance and belief, but it was. <laughs> and so I just walked contrary to what I had been doing. And God just freed me from that day. Well, day after that. But like he really set me free from some stuff where I went through a situation and I woke up straight free. Like the taste of sin was out of my mouth where I really didn't want to sin anymore. And I felt that I had the power not to do it for the first time in my life. Amen. Because I tried to get saved like five times. I promise. Like I would say the sinner's prayer like six times. Like I'm saved now, but I never really truly repented. Because we can say a prayer. All day, but if you don't see any fruit, God has not saved you. Because I, I was saying the prayers like, okay, I'll say it because I said the prayer, but there was no fruit in my life. But once I genuinely turned from my sin and looked to Jesus as my Savior, he radically did a supernatural work in my heart where I wanted to know him now. Amen? Because sometimes we, we forget that salvation is supernatural. Salvation is not that I pray and read my Bible and do godly things. Salvation is that God came inside of me, changed my heart, put his spirit inside of me. Now I have the power to walk free. Yeah. That's salvation. One of the greatest displays of the love of God is conviction. I mean, that mark in your heart that tells you, hey man, I'm falling short. I'm not measuring up. That's, 
That's not, see, condemnation is the judgment has already been passed. The gavel has already, already come down. It's over. Conviction says, hey, there's still room enough for you at the cross. There's still room enough for you. See, we're saved by this grace. It's the compassion of God that works in us two things. Both the want to do right and live right. And number two, the ability or the power to do right. You know what? Here's the truth. You're here today. You're watching by television. I don't believe that you're here because you feel as though you want to do wrong. Underneath all of that lie and that deception, deep down on the inside of you, you know that there's a want to do right. You see, I don't believe that you're wicked today. And there's a difference between a wicked person and a, and a weak person. A wicked man is the man who went out all weekend long, caught up, act foolish, and when he goes back to work on Monday, he brags about the, the bad he did, the adultery he committed, the drunkenness he participated in on Saturday, Friday and Saturday and Sunday. He brags. Then he tells you, next weekend, you need to come with me. That's wickedness. But see, a weak man is the man when he falls short and he fell into temptation and he missed the mark. He's the guy that's ashamed of what he's done. He don't want to live like that. God, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to live like that. Now here's the difference. Wickedness, God will judge. Yet, weakness, there is an ocean of grace, an ocean of mercy being extended by a loving hand of a loving Savior that says, all you who are tired, you're weary, you're heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. That's the miracle of salvation. God not only puts the want to do right in your heart, but he empowers you to do right. I want to pray for you this morning. If you're backslidden, you've, you've fallen away from God. You've ran away from the love of God. I mean, you've distanced your, yourself from God. You know it. Maybe by a cold heart. And it doesn't have to be any extreme kind of sin. I want you to hear me. I said this last week. I'm going to say it one more time. A man does not burn in hell and spend an eternity in a fiery, a fiery pit, a lake called hell because he did something or she did something bad. Men suffer the torment of hell, the absence of the presence of God for all eternity because they refused the truth. They refuse to respond to it. And here's the truth this morning. You know truth. Truth is, it's, it's knocking on your heart's door. Truth is Jesus. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life that you're seeking. Truth is what's knocking on your heart's door today. He who seeks finds the one who asks, receives. To the one who knocks, the door shall be what? Open. I want you to know Jesus is knocking. And you know it. You feel it. You sense it. I want you, I want you to make a bold decision today. Whether you're backslidden, you're falling short, you know that you're just not in a living relationship with God. Would you be courageous today and just say, Jesus, I give you all of my heart. If you're in that place today that you know, you hear Jesus' knock and you know huh, he's knocking at my house. I want you to pray this simple prayer. It's a prayer that opens the door of your heart and inviting and welcoming Jesus into your life 
to be not only your Savior, but your Lord. Would you pray with me out loud right now? Dear Jesus, I hear you're knocking. And I want you to know today that when I open up this door, this house is a mess. It's dirty. There are things that you probably don't want to see. On my, my kitchen counter, in my closet. But when I open this door, I want you to know that I believe that you come in peace today. And you've come to help clean up the house. So Jesus, today, I open the door. I acknowledge my sin. I believe that you are a loving Savior, the only begotten Son of the Father. And I give you my heart as I give myself away to you, making you the Lord of my life. Jesus, I give you my heart. Come in and be the Lord of my life. In your precious name we pray. Amen and amen, 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 amen. Listen to me, listen to me. If you prayed that prayer with me today, and you really meant it with all of your heart, man, then I want you to know right now that there's a party going on in heaven. And how many guys know that there ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop? What? It's just how it is. <laughs> I want you to know I'm proud of you, man. Heaven's rejoicing over you right now. It's the best decision that you've ever made in your life. I'm standing here in the middle of an orphanage. You know, Jesus said, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. But there's another even more essential thing than uh, just feeding someone. And this is something you need every day, and that's water. Here, you see a picture of a water filter system. Most people that will die here will die because of malnutrition and or dehydration. Most water systems don't even have the ability to fil filter out cholera. So what we want to be able to do is make sure that everyone has a clean glass of water, something that would be refreshing to drink.